good evening welcome to the day 2 of alma lecture series organized by the department of biochemistry microbiology and the postgraduate department of bioinformatics and applied microbiology yesterday we had a wonderful talk by deepa a alumni from the microbiology department who detailed on the anti pathogenic activity of probiotic e coli strain she also shared the avenues for students after the undergraduate program her delivery of subject matter acknowledgement of teachers and alma mater and calm response to questions spoke for the competence culture and confidence that we envision for our students in fact such students motivate teachers to give their best with the able guidance of our correspondent dr lata rajendran and chairman mr kumar rajendran i am sure we will continue to inspire many more students in the years to come thank you and i now request ms pramila assistant professor department of biochemistry to take over the session good evening i am very happy to introduce the resource person of this webinar ms ramani sundaram team lead research training and development nightingales medical trust bangalore who is an alumni of our college who completed her bsc biochemistry between 2005 and 2008 Ms Ramani Sundaram has completed her masters in neuroscience between 2008 and 2010 at IBMS University of Madras. She has acquired master training in dementia care and management. She has finished her diploma in project management in 2018 from Stonebridge University United Kingdom. She is the recipient of gold medal in UG Biochemistry 2008 and PG Neuroscience 2010. Her work experience between 2012 and 2013 includes guest lecturer in neurophysiology department of anatomy IBMS University of Madras teaching assistant for principles of clinical neuroscience a research perspective the institute of neurological sciences vhs medical center she has also served as research research associate between 2012 and 2013 at Edith Cohen University and McCusker Alzheimer's Foundation Perth Australia we are very much happy to have such an extraordinary alumni in the department of biochemistry MJC the department of biochemistry wishes her many more achievements in her future endeavors over to ms ramani sundaram uh thank you very much for uh, such a warm welcome uh i am ramani sundaram uh, and i am an alumni of dr njr uh, uh, college uh today i'm going to talk about avenues in biomedical sciences uh and i have tried to keep it more comprehensive uh so let me know uh, i would i am hoping that students are going to enjoy the presentation as well as uh, they would have a lot of doubts on uh, what to do after they complete uh, their graduation and what is the path ahead so uh, let me uh, go to my presentation right uh, so today i'm going to talk about avenues in social medical care research from a neuroscience perspective uh, as highlighted uh, by ma'am earlier i have my masters in neuroscience uh, so i uh, am looking into biomedical care research right now where i'm going to talk about the avenues in social medical care research which is an upcoming field and my experiences on how from biochemistry i went into social medical care research and if other students who like me are interested in medical avenues can pursue this further for their career so basically what is social medical science so social medical science actually talks about the quality and effectiveness of care previously people used to think that care and medical are two different aspects but right now the care aspect has become a bigger uh, bigger approach and people are looking at the effectiveness of care because once people have been discharged from the hospital there is a lot of post recovery that happens in the society so we need to look at the quality and effectiveness of care in the community as well as in residential care homes so when we talk about social medical science it just 
uh, does not restrict itself to hospital care. It also goes into mental health issues as well, which is also one of the topics that I specialize in, and I'll be talking about it a little more in detail. So when we talk about social medical sciences it is really multifaceted because the care when you talk about care people's need uh, it's also multifaceted but when we give the approach it needs to be person-centered because care approach differs from one person to another based on the social regime that they are in when we talk about social medical sciences it consists of two kinds of research one is community based research the other is clinical based research when we talk about community based research it's about going on to the field uh, talking to people doing surveys uh, and collecting the data there and then analyzing and disseminating it while clinical research talks about the research in the lab now, uh, when I did my research in social medical care, it was more on to health seeking behavior in developing countries, given that India is a developing country with a large amount of population, wherein a big amount of population is elderly. I wanted to study the health seeking behavior in the elderly in India. So that's what was uh, the major theme around my research. So when I talk about my specialization, I have specialization in two different fields. One is geriatrics and the other is neuroscience. So geriatrics is nothing but study of uh, elderly, their needs, basically medical. And neuroscience is study of brain. Now, uh, brain is a very fascinating organ. Uh, there is not much which was known to scientists even 10 years ago because brain have behaves very differently in different people. With the advent of functional MRI, we have understood a uh, brain much better. When you see uh, the structure of the brain, the outer structure seems to be really convoluted. It has got a lot of folds. This is what differentiates uh, our brain from the brain of animals. The outer cortex is actually the one which gives us the intelligence, the thinking, the cognitions. Now the brain is made up of neurons, as we all know, and these neurons talk to each other with something called a synapse. And there are two different kinds of synapse, that is electrical synapse, wherein the signal jumps from one neuron to the other. Then there is chemical synapse, where there is release of chemical through which the signals is being passed. So this is how our brain functions, which actually controls the respiration to the judgment that we are doing to what you're listening to what you're understanding everything is contributed by this tiny structure which sits above our head now it's encapsulated in a hard core while the brain itself is a very soft structure because it is soft structure and it is covered by the cerebrospinal fluid it can you know increase in size decrease in size so there's a lot of activity that is happening inside the brain now when we talk about brain there's one important thing that we need to understand that the brain is made up of neurons which actually get if get damaged cannot actually recover from the damage so once the neurons are dead they are dead so any damage to the brain needs to be taken really seriously because the recovery rate is very slow rather not many people recover that well from brain damage because the very nature of the brain cells so why i am talking so much about brain damage is that the topic that i'm going to touch right now is dementia which is actually a neurodegenerative disease of the brain so we need to understand what the brain is and what it is made up of what are the different functions in order to understand what dementia is which is my basic area of research now when we look at the brain the though it doesn't look this colorful it's uh, all uh, brownish gray now here i have made it a little more colorful so that we know the different regions of the brain and their functions so if you look at the brain it's made up of two hemispheres. we call it the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere uh, and the function goes that the right side of the body is uh, controlled by the left hemisphere while the left side of the body is controlled by the right hemisphere now each hemisphere has four lobes they are called the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe, which you can see on the picture there. When you look at the frontal lobe, the frontal lobe is responsible for the problem solving, the judgment, uh, our social behavior. While we look at the parietal 
the look, it's important for the sensations. For example, I'm sitting on the chair and I can feel that I'm sitting on the chair. I can feel my hands, my legs. I can feel hot, cold. All these are contributed by the parietal lobe of the brain while the occipital lobe contributes for the vision. When we talk about vision, it's not just that the things we see. When I say a red apple, even when you close your eyes, you can actually pictureize a red apple in the brain. So that complex function is actually contributed by the occipital lobe. And of course, the memory part of it is taken by the temporal lobe. Now, the temporal lobe is the lobe which is really, really important when we talk about dementia, because this is the lobe which is responsible for the memory, behavior and also language. So when I talk to you in English, and if you have studied English, you understand what I'm talking. Similarly, if I talk to you in Tamil, you can actually make the, uh, make the understanding of the words that I say. This is basically because this particular lobe takes the sound, matches it with the memory of that sound, and tells you what is what. For example, if I say apple, so when I say apple, it's just a sound says apple. So if you have studied that apple is a red color, heart-shaped fruit, and you remember that the voice and the memory just matches and you get a picture of an apple in your head so that's how the brain works the different region contributes to the working of the brain the other two important parts of the brain are cerebellum and brain stem when we cerebellum is nothing but it sits at the bottom of the cortex and it actually controls the balance coordination movement so the fine muscle movement as well so if i tell you please lift your right hand or lift your left hand do this that controls movement you need the cerebellum to work properly similarly standing you're sitting the postural everything is controlled by the cerebellum while the brain stem is basically controls the breathing the body temperature your swallowing digestion etc this brainstem is also the connection to the spinal cord. This extends as a spinal cord in our body. If you would have seen in the movie, um, people usually, uh, you know, kill other people just by, you know, moving their head to one side and there'll be a crack sound and people just die. This is because they are trying to break off the brainstem and the neuronal connection because the brainstem is responsible for the breathing. When that connection cuts off, the people die. So that's just a detour. I'm sorry, but that's how, how important the brainstem is. So my topic of specialization is dementia and related disorder so dementia is a neurodegenerative disease and we are going to talk about dementia and other disorders which actually comes under this umbrella term so what do we know about dementia dementia was only known in 1906 when uh, august ad was the first patient who actually came up to dr alois alzheimer's uh, with uh very complex neuronal uh, symptoms like she had memory loss the husband said that uh, she's not the same person he used to know and uh, she, slowly and slowly she was losing her ability to remember things to talk to tell words uh, so it was very complicated nothing that they had seen before so the doctor who was trying to treat her uh, couldn't actually understand what it actually what the disease actually was and she eventually passed away in three years but when we took the cross-sectional of his of her brain and looked it under the microscope he found certain pathology which he had never seen in the brain before and he saw that this pathology actually kills the neuron from inside as well as outside so since Alois Alzheimer's actually discovered this disease it's called Alzheimer's disease now when Alzheimer's disease was named after that people uh, clinicians tried to see a lot more people with similar kind of symptoms but when they did the cross-sectional view of the brain not all of them had the same pathology so they found out that dementia doesn't just stick to alzheimer's there are other kind of dementias as well so during this they actually termed the different other types of dementias as dementia prea cox but people with dementia not only just have memory issues people uh, just not have problems with speech they also had a lot of behavioral changes like agitation hallucination delusions which somehow started to mimic like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder so mostly psychiatric disorder so clinician then tried to put dementia under psychiatric disorders but then 
people who are treated for psychotic disorder and people who need to be treated with dementia is totally different. So when people understood that, they removed dementia from the psychotic disorder category and dementia was established as a separate disease in a clinical intervention. So now what do we know about dementia? So we know that we need to know the cause of dementia, which we know a little bit. We know how to diagnose it. We know what are the biomarkers. We have a little bit of knowledge on how to actually image a dementia brain and find out what's the difference. And also we have now a detailed understanding about how to manage a person with dementia. Now, what is dementia and what all it does entail? So when we talk about dementia, you can break it into two different terms, dementia. So D is nothing but degeneration. Mentia is nothing but mental abilities. So what is dementia? It's very easy. It's degeneration of mental abilities. So when you say mental abilities, it involves varied series of tasks from memory to my personality to decision making to talking everything comes under mental abilities as simple as brushing your teeth it involves all the parts of the brain to work together in order to brush your teeth so when we say loss of mental abilities it means loss of activities of daily living such as memory talking language uh, social connections as well as uh, functional activities of daily living such as basics like eating going to the toilet clearing your bowel all that is affected in dementia basically when we see the patient at the first hand what all do we see we see that the person has difficulty in remembering recent events or dates uh, what did i have for the breakfast yesterday what did i have for dinner yesterday so people don't remember that they tend to repeat themselves again and again so just now if the person has asked you what's the time they might after 10 minutes come back and ask you the same thing so these are few of the signs which pop up initially and when they're watching a tv they are unable to follow what's the conversation or what is happening when they meet their friends they know they are their friends but they don't remember their names so these are the kind of things that happens eventually you also see that they do have some anxiousness they're depressed or they are angry this is basically because they are unable to recollect information, neither able to put it in a format. So when all becomes confused, their behavior also tends to change. So these are few of the signs that we see in dementia early on. While the disease progresses, it becomes even worse. So people have difficulty with going to the toilet. Uh, they don't know when they are clearing their bowel. There is incontinence. And during the last stages of dementia, people actually forget how to swallow because swallowing is a skill that we acquire. And when people get dementia, they tend to follow this skill as well. So this is probably the last stage of dementia wherein people don't know how to swallow their food. And then, you know, we have to interview them and give them food via a tube. Well, that's pretty much the last stage of dementia where we know that the patient is not going to survive for long. Uh, when we talk about dementia, there, it's an umbrella term. The most famous form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot of noise around the world about Alzheimer's disease because it contributes to about 70% of dementias. But there are other types as well. There is vascular dementia, frontotemporal, and many other types that you can see on the slide. Uh, but today, mainly, I'm going to concentrate on Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, which are the pro predominant form in India. So as I told you, dementia is just a general term that we use. It basically means decline in mental ability. What we need to understand, it, it is progressive and irreversible. So what do I mean by that is with time, it's only going to get worse, not get better. And there is no point uh, or there's no treatment and you cannot reverse the disease. And the reason for that is because of the very nature of the brain, because once the cells die, you cannot regenerate the same cells while connections can form. But once the cells are dead, they are dead. Also, what we need to understand is it's not a part of normal aging. Why we have to stress on that is because people who are aging normally also have memory loss and people with dementia also have memory loss. But then uh, the memory loss is 
a little different when you compare to a normal aging person and a person with dementia. A normal aging person may not remember when he saw his best friend probably last week, you know, which day it was, but the person with dementia will not remember seeing him at all. So there are these some minor differences that we can actually make up. And it also interferes with the activities of daily living. People with normal memory loss do not have problems with brushing their teeth, but people with dementia will have problems with the activities of daily living. They may not know how to operate a remote. They may not know how to use a mobile phone and things like that. So when we talk about dementia, we basically say the five A's of dementia. If you look at the cartoon in the side, you know, the person is looking into his own image, but he's not able to understand that it is himself. So he's actually looking at him and wondering what is his name. So if you, you know, that cartoon, though it seems very simple, it actually tells that there are a lot of complex neuronal connections that have been affected in the brain. So uh, if I have to talk about the five A's of dementia, there are amnesia, aphasia, agnosia, apraxia, and atrophy. Don't bother about the terms. It basically means the loss of amnesia, memory, Agnosia is loss of recognition. So a phone is a phone, what it is used for. A bucket, what is it used for? A mug, what is it used for? So people just don't understand the usage of a particular item. So if you give them a toothbrush, they may just take it and comb their hair. So they don't know that the toothbrush is used for brushing their teeth. So that's what we call as agnosia, wherein people don't understand, uh, they don't recognize the usage of a particular object. Aphasia is loss of language so the loss of language can uh, occur in varied means like people may forget how to name uh, certain things they may even forget uh, uh, you know how to talk properly there might be a lot of fillers like mm, uh, because they really don't know what are the words to use there then there is atrophy atrophy is brain shrinkage uh, this is the most important clinical sign because that's how we diagnose dementia we look at the MRI images and see if there's actually brain shrinkage because brain shrinkage is an indicator of dementia now, when we talk about apraxia, it's about skilled movement. Skilled movement is if I tell a dementia patient that please pick up this particular object with the left hand, it's very difficult for them to do because they have to coordinate their skilled movement. So they have to coordinate their left hand to actually go reach the object. So these are the different things that are affected in dementia generally. So why, why is my topic of interest it's because in 2018 all around the world there are 50 million people with dementia in 2030 it's expected to become 75 million and in 2050 about 132 million but what does it say it says that every three seconds someone in the world is developing this disease and what's saddening is that two out of three people globally don't understand what dementia means. When we go to the community and ask people, do you know what dementia is? Most of them would be totally clueless. But this is the disease which is affecting the elderly very fast. Right now, the statistic says that in India, at least, when we look at the elderly, there are about 30% of the elderly who might have dementia, which might be undiagnosed. And what we have to understand is dementia is a long term illness because once the person is diagnosed with dementia, they may have to live with it for, say, about anywhere between five to 15 to 20 years. And the person has to be cared for just like a child. So the cost of caring for dementia patient is very high. And when it comes to our country, which come, is a part of a middle income nation, the burden of dementia is very high. And that's the reason that we all need to know what dementia is, how it affects people, and what we can do in order to help. So when we look at dementia in India, there are about 4 million Indians who are affected with dementia at, uh, at present. Even this is a uh, underreported figure because most of them are not diagnosed. As I told you, there is memory loss in aging as well. Most of the time, people just say that, oh, this might be due to old age, and they do not really bring them to a clinician for diagnosis. 
Also, the fact that going to a psychiatrist is a big stigma in India. People do think that you have some kind of a mental illness, and that's why you're going to the psychiatrist. So due to the stigma, a lot of elderly who think that they have some memory problem and need help may not take help from the clinicians. Also, the support system in India is almost non-existent. It's the family which needs to care for the elderly. And when we talk about the elderly who's completely dependent, that means one of the family member has to probably leave their job and look after them. So the financial burden is also high. And in India, when we look at the different healthcare priority, dementia is definitely not one of it. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done in this area. So now coming on to my clinical research, uh, the first research that I did was in understanding the pathophysiology of dementia. Now, uh, as I told you, there are two different kinds of dementia. One is Alzheimer's and uh, that is the vascular, which are the two different areas of interest. The first study that I did was on vascular dementia. So when I say vascular dementia, it's nothing but inducing uh, ischemic changes in the brain. So when I say ischemic changes, it's nothing but blocking the arteries, which actually supplies blood to the brain. So when the artery is blocked, the brain cells, uh, the region where the blood is not reaching, the region tends to die. So that region where the cells are dead is the ischemic region, which is dead due to loss of blood supply. So we, I wanted to understand what happens if you stop uh, the blood going to the brain for some time and see what are the different changes that happens to the brain then. So basically what we did is that I did a surgery on a mice where I actually block the middle cerebral artery. So the middle cerebral artery actually supplies to the memory region of the brain that I showed you earlier, that is the temporal lobe. So what I do is I take my mice and before doing the surgery, I actually train my mice in different kind of things. So this is the training that I do. If you see on the screen there is this morris water maze so what is this morris water maze it's a very interesting experiment basically what we do is we take a uh, tank fill it with water and we keep a platform where actually the mice can go and stand the mice once you put it in water they hate water and they are uh, they are natural swimmers so as the, as soon as you put the mice in water it will try to find a place where actually it can go and stay away from water so we keep a stand in the water which will be of the same color as the tank so it is difficult to find the mice will actually go around round the uh, tank and find the podium where it can actually stand so once you do this training for a few days, the once you put the mice into water, it will actually know where the podium is. So rather than going round and round the tank, it would go straight to the podium, which you can see in the second picture. Similarly, we also train the mice in a fear chamber. Now, what's a fear chamber? You have two different chambers there. In one chamber, we put the mice, wherein at the bottom, there is an electrical grid. So there'll be a sound. And once there is a sound, there'll be an electric shock. So the mouse will know that the sound is related to electric shock. If it goes to the next cabin, there will be shock. So it will eventually learn that it should not go to the next cabin and stay in the same cabin so that it can help itself from preventing from the electric shock. So we train the mice uh, for a few days to see how it can uh, prevent itself from a electrical shock so once you collect all this data and you know that the mouse is trained then you actually go for surgery so when the next one is a radial arm maze so the radial arm maze is nothing but there's a different arms and we put food in different arms so that the mice once you leave it in the center it will go to different arms in the search of food so now it will know okay if you go to the end of the arm there is food so we will label the arm and put food only in say about two or three arms after much training the mice will not go to any other arm it will only go to the arm where there is food so you know that the mice has now got the memory of where the food is so you now know that the mice has memory of morris water maze you know that the mice has memory of a fear conditioning chamber and you know that the mice has memory of the radial arm maze once all this memory is established you now take the mice for surgery wherein we actually open up the neck 
and we block the middle cerebral artery. If you block the middle cerebral artery just about, say, for 15 to 20 minutes, we know that the brain region, which is responsible for the memory, will start to die. So once that starts to die, we know that the area which is responsible for spatial memory when i say spatial memory is that where the permise is in space because most of the experiment that we did say morris water maze or radial arm maze is spatial memory so the area responsible for say spatial memory will start to die will start to have ischemic changes once that has been established that we know that ischemic changes have been done because i'll be doing two surgery, two mice surgery. One is control and the other is for the further experiment. The control mice, once we do the surgery, after a few days, I'll be uh, euthanizing the mice and taking out the brain and studying if at all the ischemic changes are happening in the brain. Because the second mice, which um, I will not be, uh, I will not be euthanizing, will be my, uh, study sample to see how the ischemic changes are leading to behavioral results. So once the surgery is successful, once the mice has recovered, now what we will do is we will put it again in the radial arm maze where it already knows where to find the food. But since the memory area is now totally ischemic, the mice will not remember where the food was. So if you actually put it in the radial arm maze, it will explore the radial arm maze as it is a new maze. It has never seen that maze. So if you put it in radial arm maze, you can see in the picture, it will just roam around all the uh, chambers and uh, to see where the food is. So it will not remember. So once we know it has not remembered, we know that our surgery is successful. Also, we know that the ischemic changes can actually cause brain damage. Similarly, I'll put the mice in the peer chamber and I will see that it has not learned to actually go into the safer chamber and it is still getting the electrical shock. So is for the Morris water maze, where the mouse was earlier finding the platform straight away. Now it will try to search all over the water to look look for the platform. So these are the behavioral results that I collect. And after that, once I'm done with all the behavioral study, we will euthanize the mice and preserve the brain sample and then slice it and do a staining and look it under the microscope to see what is actually happening microscopically. Uh, please pardon me for not putting my own images uh, because I don't have it with me at hand right now. So these are some referential images that I've put for you. So when you look at these images, you can see that the, for, that the area which is responsible for the memory is slowly shrinking and the cells are disappearing if you look at the image a you can see a thick layer while if you look at the image c you can see that the thick layer where uh, the cells do sit seems to be really thin it's because if you look at the d the cells are starting to die and the amount of cells that are there in this area is also reducing uh, the image that i've put on the right side is actually shows you the complete view of the brain and what we have taken here is only hippocampus which is actually responsible for the memory so why did I study this? So this particular study helped me to understand vascular dementia in uh, human beings. So in human beings, if you see, a lot of elderly do have uh, diabetes or hypertension or cholesterol. When they have all these cardiovascular diseases, it tends to affect the blood supply to the brain because there might be clots, uh, there might be atherosclerotic changes due to which the blood supply to the brain becomes lesser. When there is lesser blood supply to the brain, there is a possibility that there are certain regions in the brain which are undergoing ischemic changes, due to which they are probably showing some memory-related changes. So that's the reason why I did this study, in order to understand the pathology of vascular dementia. So after understanding the pathology of vascular dementia, I moved on to understanding other kinds of dementia like Alzheimer's. And here I went, uh, I did two kinds of research. One was laboratory research and the other one was on field research. And here I was basically working on early diagnosis. As I told you earlier, 90% of cases in India are mostly not diagnosed because people do confuse memory related changes in normal aging and memory related changes in dementia. So when they come to us or the clinicians, it is already too late to help them 
to probably rehabilitate or to be taken care of better. So when they come to us, it's a stage where they probably will only become dependent as the time goes. So here what I did was three different things. One is neuropsychological evaluation. Next is biomarkers and other is brain imaging. Now, when we talk about dementia, it's called the diagnosis of exclusion. So what does that mean? when a person comes to you and they say okay i have uh, the family says oh my father is forgetting where his keys are where his glasses are or he goes and uh, locks the door again and again uh, things like that or if it's uh, women people usually complain my mother is adding uh, salt to the food too many times she forgets to switch off the gas stove and things like that so when they tell us these kind of things we know that it, it needs some deeper uh, understanding of whether it is dementia or not because there are a lot of other things which can mimic dementia such as vitamin b12 deficiency which is quite common wherein it can uh, cause delirium delusions and and memory related changes also uh, there are other conditions like anemia uh, where uh, people can have uh, uh, dementia related symptoms also urinary tract infection in elderly can mimic dementia a lot so uh, in order to diagnose dementia we need to do a neuropsychological evaluation which is nothing but a paper pencil questionnaire kind of a thing blood biomarkers which is still in research uh, then brain imaging brain imaging seems to be the closest uh, possibility of actually telling whether the person has dementia or not along with neuropsychological evaluation so what do we do in neuropsychology? This was part of my on-field research where you actually need to talk to people, uh, where you need to run some tests on them. So if you look at there, I have put a clock drawing test uh, wherein we actually tell the person who is complaining uh, of memory loss to actually draw a clock with a particular time. And the way they draw the clock the way they tell us the time, we would be actually able to understand which part of the brain is not working properly or which particular type of dementia probably they might have. So the test, though it looks simple, the results can actually give you a lot of insights into the person's brain. Uh, if you look at the test that I've put onto the side, which is called the MOCA, the Monterial Cognitive Assessment, you can see that there are different areas of the brain that we test. So there is visual spatial, wherein we ask the person to uh, sort of complete the trial, wherein 1A, uh, 2B, C3, like that, they have to connect the dots. Similarly, you know, copy an image. So this actually tells us about the visual spatial ability of the person and then we have naming wherein we show the animals and ask them to name the animals then we have memory wherein we give them about five words and we tell them to uh, tell what are the words for immediate memory and probably after the end of the test we ask them the words again for long-term memory and we also talk about attention wherein we give them a series of number ask them to repeat it after us so this gives us a lot of knowledge about their attention and we test their language then we test their orientation orientation is basically what year it is what month it is where are you right now so we test that so this actually gives us a comprehensive view of what are the areas of the brain that are actually affected and which kind of dementia the person is likely to have and what stage of dementia the person might have. Though the tests look simple, the results that they give are of high social importance. The next is biomarkers. Now, this is the study that I did in McCusker's lab in Australia, wherein we actually looked at the blood samples of the people who are actually young not old so we wanted to see whether you can actually say that people who can get dementia in their later life since dementia is not treatable there are ways to delay it even that is under a lot of research but there are ways to delay it so our my study was basically understanding whether you can take blood samples in people who are young old young old is nothing but people who are in their late 50s or early 60s take their blood samples and look for a beta protein which is responsible for alzheimer's and see whether we can actually identify whether people with alzheimer's and people who might get alzheimer's and normal people whether there is some connection about the a beta protein so this is the work that i did in the lab where we actually studied the blood samples 
sample of Alzheimer's patient and look for uh, amyloid beta protein. Uh, usually when we uh, have to test the samples for uh, Alzheimer's disease, this is usually done in CSF, that is the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, but uh, cerebrospinal fluid is an invasive uh, technique and people have to undergo a lot of pain uh, to extract the cerebrospinal fluid and there are a lot of after effects as well. So our uh, test uh, research was basically to see whether you can find biomarkers in blood so that you can save people from the painful procedures. However, when we did the study, we found out that the biomarkers that we found in the blood are very low in concentration. Moreover, you are not able to study a lot of biomarkers in blood because of the CSF uh, brain barrier, wherein not everything from blood, from brain liquid, that is the cerebrospinal fluid, gets into the blood. So uh, that was the study all about. And then I, I also studied uh, the MRI images of the people where we used to do qualitative and quantitative study. If you look at the images here, it's the um, normal MRI image of a person versus the Alzheimer's disease MRI. You can actually see that the normal MRI of a person, there are a lot more uh, brain uh, tissue, if I may say that. And you can also see the mild black butterfly-like area it's very well shaped but if you look at the people with alzheimer's you can see that the brain tissue is shrunk and also there are a lot of free spaces as well as the middle area is also inflated they are the ventricular area which is inflated so that is the image of an alzheimer's brain now if you look at the vascular dementia brain here which is vad if you look at the normal brain uh, on the top and the bottom is the vascular dementia brain you can see a lot of white spots now these white spots are nothing but white matter lesions now these lesions are basically due to ischemic changes in the brain which have been happening for a longer amount of time in vascular dementia the changes might be happening for a longer amount of time we only get to know when the symptoms are worse so these are few images that i've put for your references now once i completed my research on um, diagnosis i went on to my next research at nightingale's medical trust where we actually started to look at okay now people we know it is dementia people have got dementia so how do we actually treat them now right now there's no treatment but we can only manage them and the management involves two part one is uh, a psychotropic management where we use drugs uh, which involves uh, memory drugs and which also involve antipsychotics now antipsychotics we use in order to control the aggression uh, delusion and hallucinations in people with dementia but somehow we have to understand how we can keep uh, the medicine dosage to the minimum so that people can function normally at the same time their memory is also not affected in a worse way so that's one kind of research that we do another one is psychosocial intervention where we actually look at different other therapies uh, like uh, you know you have these Montessori activity for children in school similar kind of activities we also do for people with dementia so that we can understand whether relearning is possible in some way uh, the next study that we also did is on telemedicine on how we can use a telemedicine platform to provide dementia care. As I told you, the number of experts in India are very, very less when compared to the number of dementia patients. So we also study the efficacy of telemedicine in management of people with dementia. Though it sounds very simple, it's a complicated platform where we have to collect all the data pertaining to a dementia patient online with the help of a software where we use, uh, you know, we have to collect the, the the blood pressure, we have to collect the sugars, blood sugars, their urine sample results, yeah, the blood sample results, their imaging, their everyday activities, these neuropsych scales, everything goes into the software and where we analyze the data and see how we are able to manage with the help of telemedicine, which is staying away uh, at a different spot and catering the service at a different spot, which is very much a talked about topic in the time of COVID. Uh, the other research that I'm actually interested uh, in and doing right now is prevention and lifestyle modification research, which I was trained by the Thinking Fit team in the UK, where we are actually seeing 
whether there is a possibility to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease, thereby dementia, through physical, mental, and social activity. So we have different uh, activity program where we put the elders through physical regime, cognitive regime, and social regime, and see how they are actually uh, benefiting through these uh, exercises. So we have uh, treadmill running, we have uh, chair-based exercises for the elderly that they do, and then there are puzzles that we give them for cognitive activity, and there are this book reading club, storytelling sessions for social activity. So we make them go through this program and see how their risk factors actually go down. So we do a blood test before the uh, before the program and then we do a blood test after the program similarly we do a cognitive uh, exercise before the program and then we do a cognitive screening at the end of the program and see how they are improving so if you look at the aim of the study, it was nothing but look at how we can modify uh, the risk factors uh, through lifestyle intervention program. And what are the different things we were using were risk factor education, engage them in physical, social and cognitive activity and monitor their health regularly. So this is the sum of the scientific impact that we see. So we basically saw that after coming into the program, we actually saw that the lot of people had um, even 67% of people actually saw their diabetes uh, getting better. 34% actually saw the improvement in hypertension. A lot of people had betterment of weight. We saw 81% of people saying we have improvement in memory, while 92% of people had better quality of life. So these are the different things that we study uh, through the program just to give you a glance. So when we talk about uh, my journey right now, uh, I did my graduation in biochemistry and thanks to the people um, in the college, my lecturers who actually kindled my interest to study further. Uh, if they haven't taught uh, biochemistry in such a uh, you know, such deeper way and not kindled my interest, I would have, wouldn't have taken neuroscience. In neuroscience, I actually do studied about brain. And uh, when I studied about the brain, the whole concept of brain damage actually was something which I felt was very, very interesting. And when somebody has brain damage, the kind of cognitive and behavioral changes that happens to them was of interest to me, which actually pushed me into dementia research. And since dementia happens to the elderly, that then pushed me into the research, uh, into geriatrics and gerontology. And when I understood that when we are looking after the elder people, it's not just the medical part. There's a lot of social care that needs to go through which I actually entered the project management part. So that's how my journey went. And I feel that when you do biochemistry or microbiology, you don't have to keep yourself uh, in, a, in a box and think that's the only opportunity uh, you have next phase. There are a lot of different things that you can do in biomedical sciences. Like you can do research, of course, you know, you do your uh, post graduation, then you do your PhD, get into research, and when you do research, you can get into two different industries. You can get into academics or you can go into industrial research. Similarly, if you feel medical uh, biomedical sciences is interesting to you, you can actually get into allied professional. That's what was my field of interest, where you can actually go and assist healthcare professional, be next to a psychiatrist uh, or assist a physician in management, or you can even go into hospital, do a lot of MRI studies like I did, or work on uh, blood tests and see uh, how different blood parameters interact and what kind of changes it uh, brings in people. All those kind of things as well, you can do it. Or you can even get into project management, wherein once you have acquired the knowledge of biomedical sciences, you can actually go into uh, projects that are actually making differences to people's life on the ground, where you can use your knowledge in biomedical sciences to bring about a change in uh, the ground, where you can actually improvise people's quality of life. So there are so many avenues. As women, when we get an opportunity to actually study, we should make most of it because that's what the world needs. The world needs more successful career oriented women because when we are when we are successful in our career, since there are very few of us who are successful, once we become successful in career, we pave path for others to follow the same. And I hope 
that whatever little I could cover in my presentation is of help to you. Uh, I'm sorry if I wasn't able to be more detailed because whatever time I had, I tried to cover as much as I can. And I hope this was helpful to you. And uh, I'd be very happy to take any questions. And of course, thank you to uh, the staff at Dr. MGR, Med MGR uh, College to have um, arranged such a beautiful session because during the time of coronavirus, it's very important that that we uh, learn, uh, learn more, and uh, use it to further the cause that is caring for people. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ramani Sundaram, for the wonderful information pack session. Queries have been ha queries have been pouring in in the chat box. Keeping the time in mind, I would pick a few questions for you to answer now. There is a common question from most of the participants. Is dementia curable or treatable if detected early? OK. Uh, as I told you earlier, that the very nature of the brain is once the cells are damaged, there's no, po there, there's no way that they can actually come back. Uh, so keeping the answer short, it's not treatable. Uh, currently, there is no treatment for dementia. Uh, it can be only managed. Uh, but people will get worse with time. Uh, even if you diagnose people early, uh, there is a possibility to, possibility to delay the progression. That's the best that one can do. OK, thank you. Uh, there's a question from Dr. Mani Megle. Is dementia inheritable? Well, uh, if we look at uh, dementia, there are, right now the study says that only less than 5% of dementias can be genetic, uh, while 95% of it is not genetic. It's uh, probably acquired due to various cardiovascular risk factors or the factors that we don't know. Uh, so very little percentage of dementia is uh, uh, inherited, not not many. There are very few genes that we know of, like the APOE4. Now, these are the genes which may run into the family, and people might uh, get dementia later on. But these kind of dementia, which is genetic or inherited, people show the symptoms really early, say in their 40s, late 40s, or early 50s. So if it comes late, like say about 65 or 70, you know that it's probably not inherited and may not be genetic. Okay, thank you. Our participant Kirtika wants to know, is there any age restrictions for dementia? Right. Um, well, I didn't understand the question properly, but dementia usually affects people uh, later on in life. Uh, the youngest patient that I have seen was 35 uh, but she had genetic uh, kind of she had the genetic alzheimer's disease which was a uh, where she was carrying a dominant gene which leads to alzheimer's disease but most of the people show the symptoms only after say 55 or 60. And people oh. do live on after dementia. So as I told you, it differs from person to person. Few people progress really fast. They may live only for two or three years, but few people survive for about 10 to 12 years. So it differs from people to people. OK, thank you. Uh, Vidya Lakshmi wants to know, is there any natural remedy to escape from dementia at its early stages? Well, uh, as I told you, uh, right now the research that I'm doing is uh, on preventive strategies. Um, though there is hope, but uh, there's no uh, confirmed uh, answer to that. But what we are trying to do is if you keep yourself physically, mentally, and socially active, you try to reduce your other risk factors such as diabetes, hypertension, obesity, etc. When you reduce that, it might thereby reduce uh, any vascular changes to the brain. So we think that keeping yourself active might have a preventive effect on dementia. OK, thank you. Uh, there's an interesting question from another participant. How do doctors diagnose whether an elderly person has dementia or amnesia? Are they different? OK. 
so when we say amnesia amnesia generally means memory loss uh, now when we say memory loss it might it can only occur mostly it occurs due to two different things one is either the person has dementia or number two is metabolic causes the metabolic causes may involve urinary tract infection as i told you or they have low vitamin b12 uh, the other thing which we are less uh, which we don't see much is due to accident that is brain damage so these are few things which can lead to amnesia which is memory loss uh, now how we diagnose dementia is as i told you uh, dementia is a disease of exclusion you exclude you first do blood test and find out there is nothing wrong with their blood they don't have uh, anemia there's no vitamin b12 deficiency then they, you do your urine you find out they don't have urinary tract infection you take a detailed history and find out they didn't suffer any head injury etc once you've done all that you do your neuropsychological assessment if they don't have any other metabolic issues then you can be sure that it's probably dementia so that's how we know the complete um, 100% diagnosis of dementia can only happen if you actually do the brain biopsy uh, or autopsy after they are dead so what we actually do is around the 95% accuracy of diagnosing dementia with the help of imaging and with the help of symptoms uh given uh, the answer we also need to understand if a person is too old if somebody comes to me at the age of 85 with uh, symptoms uh, of dementia and also have some incontinence and things like that once i do a neuropsychological assessment and i have done the bloods and the urine i know that the person might have dementia i may not send them to screening Uh, of MRI because you know just the age factor. You know that okay, this at this age, if these are the symptoms, and I have done a detailed neuropsychological assessment, probably this is dementia. Yeah, so it's a okay. lot of detailed history. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, next, there's a question from Dr. Victoria. Suggest some brain exercises to avoid dementia. okay uh well there are a lot of uh, simple exercises that one can do uh one of the things that we really encourage people is using both your hands so if you're right handed try to use your left hand a lot like try brushing your teeth with your non dominant hand try writing with your non dominant hand you know those are the, this simple thing can actually give you a lot of uh, uh brain activity uh the other thing that we also encourage people to do is called the alpha numeric coding uh for example if you look at a paragraph um, say in the newspaper give alphabets a number so there are about 26 alphabets so a is 1 b is 2 c is 3 d is 4 and so on so z is 26 so if you see and uh, see a story rather than uh you know say for example ramani you wouldn't write it as ramani you would actually write ramani in numbers so a is 1 so you put 1 there whatever is the number for r you put r there so you have to do the numerical coding for alphabets that's a very interesting brain activity and you should not actually write the alphabets in the side don't write a as 1 b as 2 just do the mental math and try to decode it with numbers when you read a particular sentence intense so that is one easy activity that uh, one can do so these two activities are quite simple that anyone can do and it's quite uh, challenging as well thank you ramani we do have a few more questions a uh, one from uh, miss deepa she wants to know does altering brain waves help in dementia treatment right so there has been a lot of uh, studies going on on uh, how uh, probably altering brain waves work but till now there are uh, there is no proven evidence on anything that helps dementia so uh, there's only a lot of a lot of evidence in management so altering brain waves actually do not seem to cure dementia similarly eeg the electroencephalogram initially were also used for diagnosing the brain wave pattern thereby diagnosing the dementia but looks like the brain waves and dementia doesn't seem to have a lot of connection Okay. Another question, what are the main blood markers for these Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease? Right. Biomarkers so, they're asking. Right. So when we talk about blood biomarkers, there are many biomarkers that uh, people are studying right now, but there aren't any proven biomarkers as of yet. So there is a uh, A beta protein that people are trying to look that's called the amyloid beta protein. Uh when we look at the pathology of Alzheimer's, there are two kind of pathology that happens. One is amyloid beta which happens inside the cell and there is tau protein which happens outside the cell. So a uh, 
two neurons connect to uh, talk to each other via synapses as i told you so the tau protein actually kills the connection between two neurons while amyloid protein kills the neuron itself so that's the difference so these are the two important biomarkers that people are trying to study in the blood as well as people are also trying to study a lot of oxidative markers because people are actually saying that probably oxidative stress so the free radicals might actually cause the degeneration in the brain so these are the different kinds of things that people are actually trying to study in the blood when we talk about parkinson's disease parkinson's disease is a neurodegenerative disease but it involves a lot of motor aspects motor movement aspects so it's not the same as uh, alzheimer's disease so for the parkinson's disease not much of the blood biomarker work is happening right now for parkinson's disease there is a clear cut uh, diagnostic criteria which involves neurological examination uh, a detailed history and mri because the neuropsychological changes happens in parkinson's disease much later what comes earlier is the motor so if you can do a neurological assessment you can actually find out if a person has parkinson's or not not much on to the blood biomarker perspective they you can actually find the parkinson's biomarkers in cerebrospinal fluids better but it's an invasive procedure okay thank you uh kavya is asking what are the different stages of dementia right uh, so uh, there are different types of classification uh, on staging uh, but the classification that uh, clinicians generally use is uh, first is uh, preclinical wherein uh, probably the person is not showing any symptoms at all uh, the next is mild cognitive impairment mild cognitive impairment there are two types there is subjective and objective uh, subjective uh, mild cognitive impairment is wherein if i am 60 and i come and tell that i have memory problem uh, i'm finding it difficult to go on with my daily life due to memory issues but when i do a neuropsychological assessment they are good there is no um, they are not scoring less to be yet classified into dementia they are called the mild cognitive impairment subjective type objective is wherein the person who is living with the uh, with the uh, subject tells us that the person is having memory loss and then we do the neuropsychological assessment but still the person is not scoring low enough to be classified as dementia this is called the mild cognitive impairment and most around 60% of people in mild cognitive impairment might get dementia later but around 30% of them do not actually get dementia then is the early stage of dementia which is mild moderate and severe so during mild dementia people will have memory problems they may not remember names but they'll be still be able to do their activities of daily living so they can go to the toilet independently they can eat independently they can wash themselves independently they can dress up independently and they may not have a lot of behavioral problem moderate stage of dementia is wherein people may need help with getting ready going to the toilet eating and they may also start to show a lot of behavioral problem like aggression hallucination they may actually since they actually forget what happened earlier they might even look for their children uh, who are young their children might be just sitting next to them but they may tell them that oh my son has gone to school while his son might be 30 and has his own kid they may would have forgotten that and they may not recognize their son and ask for uh, his son who is in the school in the past so that's the moderate stages severe stages of dementia is when a person is completely dependent they cannot uh, dress themselves up they don't remember they cannot uh, go to the toilet they don't know when they are actually uh, voiding their bladder or they are voiding their bowel so they are on diapers uh, the person may not uh, eat properly so they may need to be given mashed food because they are not swallowing and even severe stages people may forget how to swallow and might be intubated and might be bedridden because they, they they have forgotten how to walk how to move how to sit so that's the last stage of dementia okay thank you so much we do have a couple of more questions yeah uh, the next one does increasing the activity of the brain in dementia patient contribute to their recovery right uh, so recovery is a wrong term uh, to use in dementia because there's no recovery people only get worse with time whatever we do but when you do the cognitive activity it somehow delays the progression there's a lot of 
uh, initial evidence which says that doing cognitive activities might delay the progression. Also the fact that when you do cognitive activities with them, it gives them a sense of satisfaction that they are able to do something. For example, uh, I had a patient who was a retired uh, principal from a college and he had dementia. So if I ask him to put A, B, C, D, you know, I'll have this Montessori activity where I ask him to put A to Z, you know, he'll have a lot of difficulty, but with help, he can do it. And once he finishes, he used to feel so happy about himself. So these cognitive activity not just helps in delaying the progression, but it also gives them a sense of self-esteem and satisfaction. And when you keep them engaged via a cognitive activity, the behavioral problems tend to reduce because when they are idle, they have a lot of confusion they don't know what time of the day it is where they are who are the people surrounding them so once you engage them in different kinds of montessori activity it it helps them to delay the progression at the same time reduce behavioral aspects so so we we can actually reduce the kind of medication that we are using on the patient so that's the basic idea of doing montessori activities for the people thank you ramani keeping the time in mind i have picked one last question what is the okay. contribution of calming down of the brain using meditation? Right. Uh, interestingly, uh, meditation does have a lot of calming effect on normal individual. When you talk about meditation, you can do meditation with a person who can actually listen and understand the instruction. Now, these are two very important things. So the person has to sit in a place and understand what you are saying. So when we talk about a person with dementia it's very difficult to make them understand uh, you know like say breathe in breathe out close your eyes it, it's difficult for them to understand maybe in early stages of dementia there's a lot of work that you can do with them but as the dementia progresses it's very difficult to engage them in such kind of activities while uh, meditation definitely calms a person down but the problem is the person whom you are trying to give the meditation session to should be in a position to understand uh, and uh, probably comprehend what you are saying. So in early stages of dementia, meditation does provide a calming effect. But in later stages of dementia, the person is not in a state of actually listening and comprehending instruction. So it becomes difficult to actually uh, provide meditation session to people with dementia. OK. OK. So thank you so much, Ms. Ramani Sundaram. We really appreciate the time you have taken for us and for answering all the questions so patiently. Thank you so much once again. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Before we end today's session, I would like to inform you all about the tomorrow's lecture. The speaker for tomorrow is Dr. Sukanya Sham Sundar of the batch 2002 to 2005 from the Department of Microbiology. She is currently working as a research fellow in the National University of Singapore. She will be enlightening us on how to plan and choose a career. With that information, I would like to thank all of our participants for their enthusiastic participation today. And we hope to see you all same time tomorrow. Thank you so much.